everybody, Alexa Dunn here, and today I thought I would share some like seemingly super random things about publishing and being a published author that are like secrets that kind of blew my mind when I found them out. Or there's some degree of like awe to these like random things that I thought would be fun to share. Things that maybe don't necessitate a whole video or a salt list, so to speak. Not to say some of these aren't a little bit salty. Got a couple on here that I call oldies but goodies that I have talked about before, but some of these are just literally random things where I was like, oh, you know, this isn't common knowledge and I certainly enjoy that knowing this thing. So this is inspired by the first one, which was, is some publishers have author portals where you can log in at any time and see real-time sales and performance data for your books. These are the holy grail and one of my favorite things about my publisher, but where this was kind of a mind-blowing thing for me is I didn't realize this was a thing and if you're an author who's only been published by those publishers, you might think this is a very standard experience and I'm here to tell you no, it is not. I didn't have this at my past publisher and like that kind of unknowing of publishing and so much of publishing is the things that they don't tell you and the things that you don't know. The author portal is one of my favorite things about being with Penguin Random House now because it is amazing. And so when I found out, it kind of blew my mind. And I won't lie, it swayed. <laughs> it wasn't the reason I went with Penguin Random House, but it was definitely a factor. And so this is kind of a cool thing if it's something that matters to you. Obviously, you can't necessarily let it dictate. Like, you can't only submit to publishers that have this because they don't all have it. Like, I know Simon & Schuster has one too. Penguin Random House has one. If you are with other publishers, tell me if you've got an illustrious author portal. Portal. I love it so much, but it could factor in and it's this cool thing. I wish every publisher did it. And this actually kind of leads into the second thing where <laughs> it's about royalty statements. So obviously if you have a fancy author portal, you have a decent sneak preview of what you're probably going to see on your royalty statement. But something I didn't realize until, I mean, years into the industry. And that's what I find so fun about some of these. Like I, I learn new things every day. Like I'll, I'll talk to someone or have an experience and you don't know until you talk to someone or compare notes that this, what you have experienced isn't the norm. And what made it kind of mind blowing for me and I actually got to like explain this to someone the other day, a fellow author in the most frustrating way is there's no standard when it comes to royalty statements and they truly run the gamut publisher to publisher in terms of timing. Like some publishers are like clockwork and you know that you will get a royalty statement this month and this month, usually six months apart, and it's reliable and you can depend on it. And other publishers, what is to even time? What is, what is six months? What is eight? And being an author who has been with a publisher where royalty statements came when they came, and you couldn't really predict when that would be or what time even means, it blew my mind to find out that like, yeah, some some publishers you can set your watch to and you get your royalty statement, so it could be another thing worth talking to your agent about. This can be a consideration if you have multiple offers because having like a smooth royalty experience can make a huge difference. And that's just timing, actually. That doesn't even get into the, the literal format and what is on a royalty statement varies widely house to house. You'd think there would be a standard, but there really isn't. So you just have to wait until you get your first royalty statement and then you get the lay of the land in terms of what it looks like and you ask your agent to help you interpret it. And I thought that most royalty statements were pretty opaque, but then I've had friends who have shown me their royalty statements. That's when you know that it is true friendship because they will show you their royalty statements and you see their sales and their earnings. True friendship. But I've had that situation with some lovely friends and I've been like, oh, your royalty statement is so beautifully clear. And I can actually read this royalty statement and understand what it's saying. I can't say that's always been the case for me personally. And so yeah, it was just definitely mind blowing for me to discover that Royalty statements can basically be like Greek. They can actually be really hard to understand. Even when you know a lot about the industry, even when your agent explains it to you, there can be like weird like line items and fluctuations or simply information they don't put on the royalty statement for some reason. 
so yeah, frankly, it just kind of blew my mind to know there's no standard. <laughs> for royalty statements, either when you get them or how they are formatted, and it really runs the gamut publisher to publisher. Ooh, which is actually kind of like another thing that kind of blew my mind, and I've seen a lot of authors make this mistake, but it's also not universal, but it's something that I try to warn newer writers about because I fell into this trap myself. Like briefly, my agent explained it to me and I felt much better once she told me. So first, royalty statements are notoriously, I won't say useless, but borderline useless. You're generally not going to have any real picture of your actual sales unless you're like a runaway success who like very clearly has sold so many copies that Re reserve work and returns isn't an issue and you've definitely earned out. But in most other cases, your first royalty statement is really going to reflect copies printed and shipped with some sales information, but because they do this whole reserve against returns, because bookstores and booksellers can return unsold copies of books, and usually the term of the reserve against returns is one to two royalty periods, sometimes more. But because of this, your actual sales numbers may not really appear on your royalties and be real, real, real for several royalty periods, which is why I have been advised and I do advise that authors, as tempting as it is to like get that first royalty statement and like get the lay of the land and see how you were doing, to wait until you get at least a year out from publication, because that's when things will really even out and you're going to see a more realistic picture. Asterisk! Unless you have one of those beautiful sales portals where you know your actual sales and or you have a conversation with your editor, they can like tell you the real information. But I, and, and but again, it differs publisher to publisher. Not all publishers do their royalty statements that, that way where they have more copies shipped and not actual sales on that first royalty statement. But enough publishers do. I have definitely seen authors who have gotten their first royalty statement, have seen a number and it's delightful and it's high and they've gone, oh my gosh, I sold 15,000 copies. But it turns out that's actually copies shipped. It's your first statement. Your book hasn't been out that long because royalty periods are typically six months. And so they don't actually know all of the point of sales data or, the, or have the returns figured out. And so you might find in your next royalty statement, well, maybe you actually only sold 7,000 copies because half of those copies were returned, reserved, reserved against return, basically. Get your royalty statement and ask your agent what they think is on your royalty statement, basically. So the next kind of random publishing thing that kind of blew my mind and like, it seems obvious and yet, is that moment when you find out that someone really highly placed at the publisher or multiple highly placed people at the publisher have read your book. And you're like, well, of course people at your publisher read your book, but not across the board. So typically what happens, so a bunch of people might read it, some of them highly placed for the acquisitions meeting to determine if they want to buy it. Like they might be the person who does second reads, but also generally publishers, the books they buy are put on like a employee portal, like a portal and any employee can pull those books down and choose to read them or not. And so it's not like a given that say the president of the company would read your book or the head of all publicity and marketing for your publisher. And it's just kind of this mind blowing thing when and if you find out later, oh my gosh, the publisher, like the high up person read and liked my book. Cause often if that happens, your editor will pass that like nice little note onto you. And it's always this like, thing because like you think yeah my editor is going to read it people at my imprint are going to read it probably the marketing person who's going to work on it maybe the sales team etc but i've definitely had a moment or two where you're like wait that person read it especially if it's a big name that you know because it's like the head of the publisher and you're just like it's so like the imposter syndrome kicks in and it's so like embarrassing you're like oh i'm so kind of vaguely ashamed they read my work and then you go i don't think i'm supposed to nag myself like that but yeah that is something that can happen you'd be amazed who would read your book which leads me to the next kind of mind-blowing thing if you get a film and television agent, which in many cases your literary agents are going to try to facilitate for that, that for you, if you get one, like again, it seems like common sense. You're like, of course they would send your book to people to read, but conceptually, celebrities might read your book. Well, at least you hope they read your book, but even if they don't read your book, I don't even care if they read it, but just knowing that celebrities that you know and love 
were pitched your book to try to get them interested in the project and that they might have even read a summary blows my mind and I'll say that like my when my film agent told me there were two specific actors that she sent brightly burning to and obviously that didn't go anywhere but I remain to this day like in awe that those actors even like heard about a thing I did like it doesn't even really matter to me that it didn't go anywhere I'm just like mind blown and like I'll say like now anytime I watch things with those actors in them it's two specific British actors that my agent sent my book to I get like kind of embarrassed for no good reason where I'm like they might have like heard a pitch of a thing that I did and that's just it's so weird so the next one is an oldie but a goodie that is just like it fits the topic too well not to bring it up but I've made an entire video about this if you want to watch this and it's far more like known nowadays that this is a thing because people are more and more transparent but when I found out this fact about publishing this thing about publishing several years ago before it like became a more known thing mind blown is an understatement and my mind continues to be blown and it leads to so like you're, you're analyzing it and of course this is that the New York Times bestseller list is not actually a list of the best-selling books there's all of this stuff that goes into New York Times but it's like that first time that you learn that it's curated that it can be gamed the system can be gamed that things like how many copies of your book your publisher prints and then the specific bookstores they ship it to can make a difference in whether or not you list having like the right people buzzing about your book can make a difference in whether or not you list just the New York Times thinking that you are buzzy and important enough can make a difference it's mind-blowing it's it's upsetting on a certain level because you're like it's 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 like finding out Santa Claus isn't real but you're also kind of like but if that's true, maybe the system could be gamed in my favor someday. I'll allow it. One can dream. And actually kind of related to that is one that I found out more recently. You know, all know that I have a thing about starred reviews. And finding this out, did it make me feel better? Yes and no. But it was definitely a mind-blowing moment. And I think it's worth people knowing. Make you feel both better and worse, potentially. So starred reviews. So these are trades, uh, trade reviewers, magazines and, and publications that review books for booksellers, librarians, etc. The starred reviews are like their top recommendations and a starred review can make a huge difference in terms of just like the prestige of a title or even sometimes specifically sales of your book, orders of your book. Cause the, like if a library publication, a library trade gives you a starred review, librarians will probably order more copies. Same thing with booksellers. So starred reviews both matter and don't matter. And starred reviews are not controlled by the actual reviewers of the books. They're controlled by the editorial board at the trades. So meaning a reviewer, well, and, and generally the editorial board at trades have a lot of power in terms of the content that gets pushed out about books. So they can basically veto one of their independent book reviewers. I mean, independent, they pay them. So paid book reviewer. Um, and p people who review for trades are usually professionals, like they're librarians, they're booksellers, they're bloggers in some cases and they're paid to review books that are coming out. And a reviewer could give, say, this book should have a star and the editorial board can veto them. They can go, nah, we don't think so. Or vice versa, they can give a review to a book, whether it's kind of middle of the road or like glowing but no star, and the editorial board can go, this is getting a star. And the reviewer has no control and no choice. And I've actually also heard that in some cases, if a reviewer has an opinion about a book that kind of chafes against, I guess it's it it's the all powerful, I say editorial board, it's like the, the editors, the people who work at the trades, they can change their actual reviews. I've heard of this happening. And you kind of go like, is anything real? I mean, trades are already really fraught. It's also luck of the draw, like who is randomly assigned to review your book? And you can get like a glowing review because they happen to be someone who really likes your genre or really connects to your voice or they're just a more generous reviewer or you can get an absolutely scathing takedown because of opposite luck. So trades are already like, 
yeah, so that, it blew my mind. It continues to blow my mind. And, and I will say, I've heard about this. I've had this confirmed at a few publications. It's, I'll say, not all publications, just as like a disclaimer, just in case, we'll say allegedly, just in case, but I've heard this happens at, I've heard it happens. So another oldie but goodie that I brought up in querying videos and submission videos, but is always worth repeating, because like when I first like started to really realize this, I was like, huh. And it continues to blow my mind in the sense that you judge your own experiences against friends' experiences, you judge different experiences against each other. Like I'm always kind of taking the temperature and trying to figure out like, I like analysis. I like strategy. Like how does publishing work is always the question. And it just never ceases to amaze me that who your agent is can just make such a marked difference in terms of your publishing experience. Legitimately, depending on, on the agent, I'll use the word caliber, but it's, it's a bit more nuanced than that. It's, caliber personality, like how magnetic they are, how many bestsellers they've had before, like how much they're considered a tastemaker. Just like the speed with which they can get their authors, their submissions prioritized by editors, not just prioritized by editors, like read fast. Um, your statistical likelihood of getting offers from certain publishers can go up depending on who your publisher is. The speed of the off offer can differ depending on who your agent is. The amount of the offer, like how high the starting offer and the offer generally is likely to be, is going to be largely, not always, but often influenced by who your agent is. Also just like the level of editor that you're more, more likely to actually get seen, read, and uh, offered by <laughs> uh, is going to vary depending on agent, meaning there are certain agents where like they are going to send submissions to the publisher. Well, and the publisher has the power to turn around and offer fast and to offer a lot of money more than a junior editor would. And so like, just like all of that hierarchy stuff, is continually mind blowing to me. And I know that's really, that's stress inducing. Yes, it is because it, it places so much value on like the rat race of who your agent is. And I will disclaim that yes, that is true, but it's still something that I just see happen over and over again. And it always blows my mind where you're, you're just like, wow, that agent really did that. And kind of related to that in terms of just like, it's a mixed bag of the industry, but still you'd be amazed. Editorial experience can vary so, so widely. It's weird sometimes, meaning not all editors are created equal. And you go, that's kind of obvious. And yet, I guess like, I certainly came into publishing assuming that the bare minimum standard or like for an, a person in editorial to become an editor and ascend the ranks that they would need to be pretty good at editing, specifically like dev editing and really working with authors. That sounds so like catty, but here's the thing. It's, it blows my mind. Like you get like a little further in and you trade stories with people and you share experiences. Some editors are really, really bad at their jobs, including at major publishers. And you'll just hear these stories where they just, they basically don't edit. And that's the mind blowing part to me. Some editors really don't edit. Not that I like to fuel that conspiracy theory that you hear a lot, especially from naysayers about traditional publishing. And I'll say like, it is a minority of editors. You really do hear specific names come up repeatedly where it's, it's often like not even malicious. It's just, there's such a light hand at editing. They're like more like cheerleader editors that they don't necessarily put their authors through their paces and it can explain some books in a lot of cases though. The thing is, is that you never know. And so part of the mind blowing thing or, or the arithmetic that you do is going, so that book, is it that the editor isn't the best editor or is it that the author doesn't edit well? And it could always go 50, 50 by the way, but it blows my mind to hear that there's such wide variation in experiences with authors, with their editors, where some editors just do a lot more hands-on work. They provide a lot more support to their authors. They push their authors a little bit harder to make their books as good as they can. 
And mind you, there's extremes of that. There are also some editors who love to have their authors completely tear down and rewrite their entire books, and that just, like, really stresses me out and I start to hyperventilate, but it's really that other end. Like, when I found out that some authors literally coast right through editorial and don't do anything to their books, especially as an author, like, I want my editor to push me and I enjoy editing, that was a mind-blowing moment for me. And uh, I just, like, as an author, like, I don't want that. And so, it, mm, just, yeah. Oh, uh, to cycle back to trades briefly, this is when um, I asked a friend, like, what were some things that really surprised you? And she brought this up, and that is that trade reviews actually aren't a given. And she is correct. Um, especially I've heard increasingly with changes in the industry, more and more books being published, COVID pandemic related things that there are, there's like a backlog of books. There aren't enough reviewers. There's not enough time. Everyone's behind. And so it is definitely no longer a given that you will get trade reviews from all of the trades. But I'll also say what sometimes does impact this is it is like Schrodinger's trade review because you always go, did I not get any trade reviews or a lot of trade reviews because trade reviews are impacted and you're not guaranteed a trade review? or because the publicity department at my publisher forgot to send my book out for review. That does happen. It's always the question. But yeah, you are not guaranteed a trade review. And it's kind of, I think that it's a reflection of the changing industry, because I feel like when there were fewer books being published, I feel like most books did get pretty wide trade review coverage. But that can be like a kind of annoying disappointment thing where you're like, huh, I didn't get that. And the other thing my friend pointed out to me that does make total sense, uh, that you might not always be sent your trade reviews because if the trade review isn't positive, your, your editor might actually keep it from you to kind of protect you, <laughs> which is <laughs> interesting. So another one that I, I definitely intellectually kind of knew, but when I hear specific cases of it, and also as I increasingly experience it, that comes with an asterisk, because when I tell you this, you'll understand. It just, it, it blows my mind. How many times do I say that? Drink responsibly. Um, and that is that even the authors that you think of as like superstar authors, that's the asterisk. I am not a superstar author, but like think about, but I mean, isn't that relative? We're always looking up at authors who we think of as more established than we are, who, who we think of, I mean, who are bestsellers in many cases, who are really popular, who mean a lot to us, who maybe are formative writers for us, and have years more of experience in many more books. We always think that they're set, right? And, and they must be getting all the things. And, and, and you see them everywhere, etc. You'd be amazed because the thing is, there's always something that isn't happening or can go wrong or does go wrong that bothers authors at all levels and all kind of experience levels and especially I've heard from a couple of sources like someone would tell me oh XYZ super bestseller that you know doesn't get a lot of support from their publisher and you're like okay and then they contextualize that and you're like oh I actually see that and that's the mind-blowing fact of very often when a book is doing really, really well, an author already has a strong established brand or it's meeting the secret benchmark the publisher has set, which I'm gonna get to, they go, great, we don't have to do anything. And so they don't. And so it can actually be the case where a best-selling author can be frustrated because their publisher isn't doing a lot to push their book either because their publisher is perfectly satisfied with whatever the book is doing organically, even if theoretically, if they did something, it could exponentially increase the success of that title. And so it's just kind of the mind blowing thing of like authors, they're just like me, that author you look up to, they're just like me. And I've also had conversations with people who I really admire and look up to. And I found out they have all the same frustrations that I do about different things. And I'm just like, heart eyes. It makes you feel less alone. It also makes you go, wow, if they're not getting X, Y, Z. <laughs> just staring, staring into the abyss publishing. So it's, that one's both like heartening to it's, it's like to know that you're not alone and that like we're all in the same boat but then to also go oh we're all in, we're all in the same boat. And that's the thing. Um, publishers have like a secret number of copies 
that they want you to sell or expect you to sell, but they don't tell you what it is. <laughs> I've heard apparently that if you push enough, if your agent pushes enough, you can maybe get this number out of them. Um, I've never taken those steps, but I'm fascinated. So it's it's kind of that thing where they apparently have an, an, an invisible target, like invisible to you. They have a target and then you don't know what it is. And depending on whether or not you meet or exceed that target determines whether or not they're happy with you or disappointed. This is such an abusive relationship. <laughs> But yeah, I was kind of like, of course they have a secret number. And it makes sense, of course they have a sales goal, but it's still kind of like, interesting that they don't tell us. And finally, the thing that continues to blow my mind on a consistent basis, because as I go through publishing, you see things and you're like, huh, and then you find out, oh, an author got that because their publisher paid for it. And that is the fact that a ton of stuff that you see out in the world, which is essentially boils down to marketing publicity, is marketing and publicity. There are things that publishers are paying to have happen for a title. And this both makes you slash me feel better and worse because on the better side, it's like, oh, it's something that's totally out of my control. XYZ thing isn't a determination of quality or how much someone likes me or whether my book is any good. It's just, oh, that book is a lead title at a publisher and they put a lot of dollars and kind of push behind it. And to clarify, this isn't always literally pay to play, like money exchanging hands, but it's all sorts of little things. There are tons of little ways that are all backed up by cold hard cash that can make a difference in how much stuff a book gets and where it's featured. And just some examples of this, uh, in many cases, bookstore placement can be pay to play, though, fun fact, Barnes and Noble, that used to be the standard. And that's what I shared in my video about bookstores. It is no longer the standard at Barnes and Noble since Waterstones bought Barnes and Noble. So now actually individual stores can control their displays in the same way that indies can. So that aspect of pay to play has changed a lot, but in other retail spaces, it is alive and well. There are things like book clubs and book boxes where very often the titles that you see chosen, they're not randomly chosen out of a sea of all potential books. They are in many cases heavily pitched by the publisher. And so thus it's about, well, what has the publisher decided is the book of the moment? That's the thing that gets all of the push behind it. And that trickles down to, it, again, it's, it's dollars and it's publisher commitment, literally just the bandwidth of the employees who are assigned to books, who are told to prioritize a title. That all boils down to publishers having that skin in the game and pushing a title. Uh, lists that things are on, various honors. Honestly, I'm constantly amazed where like you'll see a thing and you'll be like, oh, that's so cool. And then someone will tell you, yeah, that's because it's the lead title for the publisher and they made that happen via XYZ. Essentially, if you are the book darling, that is amazing and fantastic. But if you are not the book darling, which the majority of books and authors aren't, like it still sucks, but at least you like, you feel a little less gaslit, I hope, knowing that it wasn't like out of all books in the universe, that one was plucked out because it's clearly the best, way better than you. When it's more like the publisher pushed it really, really hard. So it was one of just a few titles that was on the radar of whatever the thing is. And that makes a huge difference. Or in some cases, it's literally, it's money exchanging hands or it's lots of money put behind some something in order to give it an edge against all other things. And this can include things like exclusive editions and whatnot. So, you know, it's just another thing that is out of your control. <laughs> and I'm sure next week I'll find out about another thing. I because I do have things I suspect are pay to play that I don't have confirmed. And I'm always like, I got my ear to the ground of like, did the publisher pay for that? That's let me know down below in the comments, did any of these surprise you? If you are a published author, do you have some like favorites where you're like, what? I, I always love hearing about these. There's always something new that you can learn about publishing. As I said, I continue to have my mind blown. Like I'll see something and then someone will be like, actually it's that. And I'm like, it all makes so much sense. Get this 
this video a thumbs up if you like it and I will make more like videos about the publishing industry and aspects of writing. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and happy writing.